All right, guys, welcome to the inaugural <clears throat> um, Paramedic Pearls and Pitfalls video cast that we're going to try to try to do. Um, this is new for me. I'm learning how to do it, all this technology associated with it, so bear with me. My whole goal here is to go over topics that are pertinent for paramedic students for any type of um, emergency worker going through school that can try to help you out in your uh beginning education. All right. We're going to start with one of the topics that tends to always come up for paramedic students and gives them a problem at first is EKG and electrical conduction system and that's where we're going to start. We are going to try to keep these at around 10 max 20 minutes. A uh, little small aliquots of material so you can download anything pertinent or you can watch anything pertinent at the time and not have to uh, go through all of the information to find what you're looking for. So this one is entitled our electrical conduction system. All right. Well, I have a video right here that's kind of looping the uh, electrical conduction system of the heart in relation to what it will represent on an EKG. And that's going to loop for you so you can watch that throughout and kind of bury that image into your head because it'll help you out on exams and it'll and that help you out in the long run when you're uh, thinking about rhythms, diagnosing rhythms, and actually what's kind of going on. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to start with the electrical conduction system here. We have automaticity. Now, muscles have a whole bunch of different kind of properties, but cardiac heart muscle has a unique property, and that property is our automaticity. All right. Automaticity is uniquely found in the heart, and that is what enables the heart to generate its own electrical impulse without any type of stimulation from outside. It doesn't need anything from the brain. It doesn't need any brain control, even though the brain does can help control it. The heart is able to do this all on its own by this special property called automaticity. Right? It is unique of the heart, unique feature of the heart. So you might want to remember that. You're going to see that come up over and over again. The dominant pacemaker of our heart always starts with our SA node. That is the dominant heart. And we're talking about a healthy healthy heart that's starting in the SA node. And we're going to look at this little chart over here. And this glowing yellow right here is our SA node. All right. And a good another good thing to re remember for your exams are is that it receives its blood from the RCA. It's right coronary artery. And you might see that come up again, so keep that in the back of your nugget. <clears throat> All right. So here we have our little diagram of the um, electrical conduction system, always starting with our SA node. The SA node is then going to release its electricity and fire, and the electricity is going to travel down our intranodal pathways here. It's also going to travel across a pathway like this to our left atrium that connects our left and right atriums here. You can kind of see it in this video right there. This is our Bachmann's bundle, all right, or our intraatrial pathway. And that's what allows the left and right atriums to fire at the same time and, and let them depolarize at the same time, all right? So we have SA node intranodal pathways, our Bachmann's bundle. Then the electricity is going to go down to the AV junction, or the AV node here, located between my atrium and my uh, right ventricle here. And what that's going to do is going to hold the electricity to allow the atrium to fire and the ventricles to fill with blood. All right. So once the gatekeeper, as they might call it, um, releases the electricity, it's then going to travel down the bundle of his to my right and left bundle branches up through my Purkinje fibers. Okay. And you can see that all on here. We have SA node, uh, internodal pathways, AV node, AV junction. Here's my bundle of his my bundle branches, and there are my little Purkinje fibers that are uh, depolarizing my ventricles. All right. Whenever you see dromotropy, all right, because we got those three effects that we always talk about in school, we have inotropy, dromotropy, and chronotropy. Our dromotropy is what's going to be our electrical conduction stimulus. Whenever I have a drug or something like that that increases dromotropic effect, I'm going to have a drug that increases the electrical conduction force that's actually going on in the heart. All right, So there's some terminology that we have to get down. Whenever I'm talking about depolarization, I'm not really talking about 
the actual physical contraction of the heart. All right? I'm talking about the depolarization, the actual sodium potassium pump uh, generating electricity through that that um, electrical gradient that's going on. Remember, classic test questions you're going to see are what are the most abundant um, extracellular cation and what is the most abundant intracellular cation. All right, your most abundant extracellular of course is going to be your sodium. Your intracellular is going to be your potassium. I just remember by saying sodex and potent. You remember that? Sodex and potent. So sodium is going to be extracellular, potassium is going to be intracellular. That creates a concentration gradient, an electrical gradient. Those two are going to cross. They're going to generate electrical impulse in my sodium potassium pump, right? Um, so they always try to maintain those concentration of ions, and that's what stimulates the conduction system in order to start happening, all right? Whenever I'm talking about repolarization, I'm talking about sodium, potassium starting to switch places back again, but calcium then plays a role. Calcium plays a huge role in maintaining uh, cardiac electrical depolarization. It prolongs cardiac, uh, cardiac action potential at phase three <clears throat> in the action potential diagram that we went over in class. Um, so calcium is an important role in also repolarization. We can see that on our EKG as well. All right. Um, refractory periods are important for us, and we'll go over that in class when we're doing cardioverting and why it's actually important to get down what a refractory period actually is. But we have two main refractory periods. We have absolute and we have relative. If I were to look at my EKG over here, I could say that between these two lines, that would be my absolute refractory period a that's the heart cannot generate its own electrical impulse again the heart doesn't want to depolarize while it's depolarizing all right it doesn't do that so we call the heart is absolutely refractory to any other type of electrical stimulus but right after that we have the relative refractory period where the heart's actually starting to repolarize and it's in the process of repolarizing it's called relative refractory period because it can't accept another electrical impulse there but it usually doesn't. If the heart depolarizes while it's repolarizing here, then bad stuff starts to happen. This is the bad thing with R on T phenomenon or prolonged QT intervals. This is also the problem that if we cardiovert somebody <clears throat> and we accidentally have it set to cardiovert on a T wave, we can actually put our patient into cardiac arrest. And uh, more specifically, especially on your exams, you're going to see that your patient is going to go into a torsades or torsades de point or de point, however you want to pronounce it. All right? So we always want to make sure that we cardiovert on the R wave, not the relative refractory period. All right? Very important in clinical aspects and um, when you're doing your test. Absolute refractory periods. So always want to remember that. <clears throat> All right? This diagram's in your book. We're not going to hit that too much because we are doing a little review here. But. These are the numbers that we have to remember. They're going to come up to with you or come up in class again and again. Your SA node, intrinsic firing rate is 60 to 100. Remember that number. If for some reason the SA node starts to fail and the AV junction of the AV node starts taking over primary pacemaker role, its intrinsic firing rate is 40 to 60. Again, if that were to fail and something else were to start taking over primary pacemaker role, your ventricles then start kicking in to be the boss man. Their intrinsic firing rate is 20 to 40. I've seen some books label it as 15 to 40, but according to this slide, it's 20 to 40. So that's the number that we're going to have to learn. All right? The farther away you get from that SA node, the slowing of the intrinsic firing rate. As a general, as a general rule, you might want to remember that. All right? So keeping all these in mind, we can actually look at the electrical conduction system on an EKG. And that's what it is. An EKG is the representation of the electrical stimulus that's going on in the heart. It has no bounds on the mechanical action. That's where we get our blood pressure. That's where we get our pulses. That's where we get our skin conditions. All that is the mechanical perfusion of the heart. Here, we're looking at the electrical stimulation of the heart. All right, And that's what we see on our EKG. It's a series of waves and complexes, and every single bump, every single wave on this EKG means something, and that's what we're going to go over next. All right, It's comprised of the P wave, QRS complex, repolarization of the ventricles, produces our T wave. All right, That's what we do. That's what we look at. 
We have other types of measurements as well. We have a PR segment, we have an ST segment, we have an R to R interval, the distance between each R wave and our EKG. Those all matter, and we will go over that when we start talking about our EKGs. All right? We're going to end this podcast, or this video cast, I, I should rather say, with the actual aspects of the EKG itself, very broadly, very basically. Looking at this, I'm going to go ahead and pause that. Uh, when it comes up to an EKG, I'm going to I'm going to pause it. I'm going to pause that right there. All right. And take this and we can blow that up so you can see it a little bit better. All right. Looking at our EKG, anytime I see a flat line on my EKG, it's saying that there is no electrical stimulus going on. All right. That is when the heart is at rest. Right here, my P wave is where this SA node starts to fire. All right. I have to make sure that I have a P wave. I have to make sure that it's upright and rounded. Upright and rounded is key word in this sentence. If it's peaked, if it's dipped, let me draw that out for you. All right. If it's dipped like that, that's not an SA node P wave. That's something else. If it looks peaked, that is not an SA node P wave. You have to make sure it's upright and rounded. That is an SA node P wave. Then we have, <coughs> excuse me. Then we have another line here. That is another area of isoelectricity. From here to here is my PR, I'll write it out, PRI, for my PR interval. All right? My PR interval is very important because that's what I'm going to use in order to diagnose heart blocks. All right? And we'll get into that when we do our heart block section. Then we're going to have a Q wave. All right? You might see a Q wave, you might not. Q waves are not normal. Um, but they could be normal in our healthy patients or our younger patients or skinny patients. They could present with a QA, but it's never too big. It's always kind of small. So we're going to pass over QA for right now. We're going to do that when we uh, get more into uh, e actually reading EKGs. Then by definition, my first upright deflection after my P wave is my R wave. The R wave is what's um, my, ventric my ventricle starting to depolarize. All right. Once my ventricle started to polarize, it's going to generate this large R wave. <clears throat> now, repolarization starts in the back side of my EKG here. My S wave is my repolarization, and my T wave is also ventricular repolarization. All right. So that's what those represent on my EKG. So I have atrium contracting, my AV junction holding the electricity, allowing the ventricles to fill with blood. Then my ventricles depolarize, repolarization repolarization and my heart does it all over again 60 to 100 times per minute and a normal heart if we look at over here my SA node here is my P wave all right my P wave is starting to fire which is going down to my AV junction I'm holding the electricity which is now my PRI my ventricles fire generating an R wave everything starts to repolarize again creating my S and T and that is the basis behind these waves, P, Q, R, S, T, All right? Another thing about the paper, and we'll go over the paper in the next segment. These boxes mean uh, certain things, and we have to get down to what the boxes mean as well because tests love those questions, all right? That is going to be the end of this EKG, uh, this electrical conduction vodcast. I hope this will be able to help you out, and there will be many more to come.